Hey, good morning, everybody. So good to have everyone here today. How are you doing? If you and I haven't met yet, I'm Jared. I'm grateful to serve as one of the pastors here. And if you're joining us for the first time or you're with us all the time, we want to just say a big mahalo for tuning in today. In fact, I'm so glad that you did because today we are kicking off a brand new series entitled, watch this, The Kako Life. The Kako Life. You see, in Olelo Hawaii, in Hawaiian, the word kako is such a special word. It can be defined as us, we, and together. And it's a word that when spoken includes the speaker as well as those that he or she is addressing. But not just that, but also includes all the others in that context. It means that nobody is left out. Isn't that awesome? And so here in Hawaii, we may have heard speakers greet people by saying, Aloha mai kako, which means greetings and love to each and every one of us. It's interesting to me that so much of the language and the values of the people of this land are so tied to the value system of the kingdom of God. <laughs> Isn't it awesome? And so in this new series, we're going to be navigating through what it means for us as the people of God to live kako in Christ. But more specifically, what it could look like not just in our weekend gatherings, but in our daily lives throughout our week. And so throughout this series, for the next four weeks, our teaching team and I will be looking at four commitments, four ways in which we will be able to focus in on how we'll be able to live life together in the way of Jesus. And today I'm going to be overviewing that a little bit of, of our whole series. And so that's what we're going to be go going today. So buckle up, get ready. But, but before we get there, before we get underway, let me ask us this quick question. Okay, I want to ask you this question. I want you to go ahead and respond, in fact, to this question in the chat box if you can. All right? Here's the question. How many of you would consider yourself an observant person? Go ahead and respond in the, in the chat box right now with just a quick me or I do right now in the chat box. How many of you would consider yourself an observant person? Now, this is not a trick, all right? For those of you who are um, watching this right now with others, um, I want to ask you how many of them would agree with you? Like, how many of them would agree with you? Come on, let's be honest. Uh, like, like. Have you ever been asked by someone this question? Excuse me, you, you notice anything different about me? <laughs> Anyone ever heard that before? Listen, I have. I usually have a, a go-to response, two go-to responses to that question. It's either, did you do something to your hair? Or, is that a new outfit? Those are my two, two go-to responses. But here's what I've learned, right? I've learned this, is that if you've been asked the question, you're probably already too late. Am I right? And all the, all the ladies in the house said, amen, right? Amen. And so here's what I want to do. I want to do this. I want to conduct a little experiment with us today. Okay. And this might be a little strange for you, but, but I want for those of us who are watching online, if, if you are watching this with a group of people or somebody else, I want you to pause for a moment and look at one another. Okay. Go ahead and look at one. In fact, I want you, if you could, to stand to your feet and look at one another in the room right now and start making observations. Okay. What, what do you see? What do you observe? Don't say it out loud, okay? Don't say it out loud, but I want you to make a mental snapshot of what you see and what you observe and maybe even what you feel. What's the emotion that that creates, okay? And go ahead and after that, go ahead and have a seat. We're actually going to come back to that a little later, but I want you to hold on to this thing that you maybe observed in that really brief exercise and we'll circle back to it at the end, all right? Now, if you're asking me this question about what I observe whenever I'm at an in-person church service with many of you, like on a Saturday evening, one of the things I observe, maybe most obviously, is that everyone there is in rows, right? Like the chairs are all facing in one direction toward me. I'm, I think, if I'm being honest, most pastors like me, myself and other pastors like rows. I mean, we, it, it, it's kind of organized, kind of like this, right? We kind of like rows. It's all like where everybody is like kind of facing forward in the same direction. And, and it's kind of like you get to share and, I, and the person up front is speaking for like 24 minutes or so. And it's comfortable to have these rows like this. 
But here's what I found to be true in my study of scripture and my life as a pastor, is that when you look at the early church, they spent very little time in spaces like this, in rows, looking at the back of other people's heads and listening to maybe a pastor or someone lecture for half an hour. In fact, the picture that we get from the early church is actually way less of rows and more, way more of something called circles, where, where people would face one another and do life with one another, kind of like this, right? And so I want to ask us if we could to um, just think about this, is that rows are good, rows are great. But listen, I want to just propose today, here's the main idea. Rows are great, but circles are better. Rows are great, but I think circles are even better. And so we're going to be in Acts chapter 2 today, and I want you to turn there. We're going to be, or flip there, or scroll there, whatever sorcery you do to get there. I want you to join with me to Acts chapter 2, and, and that's where we're going to dive in today. Let me give you a little bit of context before we get started. Acts 2, Jesus was crucified. He died and was buried, right? And, and, and he rose on the, on the third day. And he spent about 40 days with his disciples. And in Acts chapter 1, he ascended into heaven. And so Acts chapter 2 actually signifies a really big shift. God has been working through Israel, but now God is going to work through something called the church. He's um, been working through the, the Jews, and now God will be working through the nations. In chapter 1, the disciples were waiting for the Holy Spirit. And in chapter 2, he comes. In chapter 1, the disciples were equipped. But in chapter 2, the disciples are being empowered. In chapter 1, the disciples were held back. But chapter 2, the, the, they're, they're sent forth. In chapter 1, Jesus ascended. In chapter 2, the Holy Spirit descends. And so let's pick it up in Acts chapter 2. We'll, we'll kind of just look at the, the verse 42. Verse 42, this is what it says. Follow along with me here. It says this, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayer. And, and all came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers day by day, those who were being saved. Isn't that awesome? Now, if you were to not be familiar with this passage here, the, the, the 41 verses prior to verse 42 here describes the coming of the Holy Spirit, where Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends, preached this incredible sermon, and 3,000 people responded in faith in Jesus. And I wanted you to look with me at um, what we just saw here. I want, I want you to look with me at verse 46. And we're going to look at it again. It says this again. It says that, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread, in their homes they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Isn't that awesome? So the early church we see here met in rows, right? At the very beginning of verse 46, it says that they met in the temple, which is what they did collectively. And they love meeting in rows. And so we do that. I mean, we love meeting in rows, right? But, but watch this. The second half of this verse, in, in, it, I think it communicates something very, very significant. It says that they also broke bread and they shared life together in homes. They met daily. They did, it, they did more than just simply attend an event once a week. They were, were able to share life together. They broke bread. They lived lives ka. Co. And so what I want to do is briefly unpack why I think living in circles or kako living accomplishes these four things in our lives. In the early church, we see that circles that looks a lot like life groups, by the way, 
was expressed in four different ways. It was found in spiritual depth, physical needs, emotional support, and missional living. Kako living in four different ways. It was spiritual, physical, emotional, and missional. And I want to talk to, the, to us about the first one. The first one is spiritual death. In verse 42, it says this. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. And so the word here in the scripture, it's, it says devoted. Here, it, it's really, really significant, this word in the original language. It, it's not a one-time verb. Like, like sometimes when we think of a devotion or a vow, we sometimes think it's like a one-time decision, like a one, one statement, one thing that we do that one time. But it actually means this. It means continued steadfastly and constantly and continually to give unremittent care to something or someone. In other words, they paused day after day together. They sought God not as an individual activity, but they learned and prayed and celebrated ka this is why I think the Apostle Paul wrote things like this for the church in Ephesus. He said this in Ephesians 4, 16, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which is equipped when the, each part is working properly, making the body grow so that it builds itself in love. Isn't that pa passage awesome? awesome? That's amazing. Now, now that passage in Acts it also uses the word Fellowship. How many of you have heard that word before? Fellowship. And, and I don't know how many of you grew up in church, but for me, there was always a place in church, in a church building that we call the Fellowship Hall. Anyone familiar with the Fellowship Hall? That was basically like Christian code for where the snacks are held, right? And I was very well acquainted with the Fellowship Hall. But listen, the word fellowship is way richer than simply saying, oh, that's the place where people socialize, or that's the place where snacks are held, or that's where luncheons or potlucks are. You see, the, the word fellowship here in the Greek, in, in the book of Acts, is the word koinonia. Say that with me, koinonia. And it's, it's the easiest way to break this down for us, this word, it simply means choosing a life together in spiritual friendship. It's just like choosing to be spiritual friends and listen, when we gather like this, you know, like online or even um, at services or in Bible studies, when we gather like this, it, it's a special thing. Like maybe for some of us, we grab coffee or we hike. That's all fellowship. But can I be honest with you though? Most of those instances, most of those instances that, that we, are, we gather together are pretty plan planned, right? Like they're pretty planned. Now, I'm, I'm kind of new to, you know, this social cue, so correct me if I'm wrong, but, but typically when we say things like, hey, stop on by anytime, what do we really mean? Like when we say stop on by anytime, what do we really mean by that? What we're really saying, if we're being honest, is call first and we'll schedule a, 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 some, a gathering time, a meeting place, and, and we'll put it on our Google calendar and, and I won't know that you're coming until you accept that invite, right? That's typically what we mean by stop by any time. But watch this. Fellowship is more like welcoming a friend to experience all of life with you. Even when there's laundry on the floor, dishes in the sink, and the baby is crying. Fellowship or koinonia is is just when a parent dies and you're sick and your, your friend is coming over to take care of you. It's getting up early for breakfast to confess and pray with another person your sins. It's seeing each other in the good days and the bad days, day in and day out. You know, I love what Pastor Andy Stanley says in this about spiritual friendship. This is what he says. He says that your friends determine the quality and direction of your life. And we kind of know this to be true, don't we? Look, look at the five people that you are closest to and you'll get a snapshot of the direction that you're headed. You see, fellowship is not just simply a hall and a church building. It's, it's even more, it's more than that. It's not just this exclusive thing that we do on, on Saturdays when we get together or Sundays, what we used to do. Although it's a big part of it, it's, 
inviting someone into our lives. Koinonia is like you seeing me at my best and you seeing me at my worst. And I don't feel the need to clean my whole house for you to come over because we are doing life together and that's fellowship. Now, the second way I believe that, that there's living in circles is so crucial and, and, and this is one of the, the ways that we can show that is through our physical needs, our physical needs. You see in Acts chapter 2, verse 44 and 45, this is what it says. It says this, And all who believe were together and had all things in common. Verse 45, And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as had need. I love that. I love just imagine that what that could look like. And so by obeying the apostles' teachings, the, 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 the early church was mimicking the most generous man in the world. You see, just like Jesus would share all that he had, the first century church lived in such a way where no one had a need. I mean, imagine that. It, was, it wasn't a, a, a thing that was forced on them. It was actually just a, a response to God's love to them. You see, John... 316, a famous verse that we all know, many of us know, is that for God so loved the world that He what? He gave. He gave His one and only Son. He gave. Our God is a generous God that gives. Can you say a good amen to that family? He gives. He's a giving God. And so any generosity is a reflect, it's a response to God's love and generosity to us. And so could you, could you see what that could look like for us today? What would that look like for us today? Well, I think it might look like us running errands for someone in need. It might look like us making a meal for a family or a friend in crisis. It could be just driving someone to a doctor's appointment. You see, circles allow us to do this, not only to meet the needs of those around us, but watch this, it also allows us to have our needs met as well. Listen, I just finished walking through Paul's letters to the Ephesians. And, and, and it reminded me uh, that every one of us know people who are fighting a battle that we know nothing about, right? And the armor that Paul describes is an armor that we can't put on ourselves. It's not just simply a meeting of needs. The circles actually allow us to do battle together. Can anyone think of a name or a face or a story where you were in a, the midst of a battle and it was with somebody that you'd done life with, that entered into that pain with you, that stood arm to arm with you and linked their shields to your shield and said, we're going to get through this no matter what together. That doesn't happen in rows, you guys. That happens in life group. Because listen, it's easy to miss each other's needs when we're staring at the back of each other's heads. Does it make sense? This kind of care happens in circles between the weekends. Can you say amen to that, somebody? And so family, this is what the early church did. They, they, they supported one another in, in circles, in spiritual depth, in physical needs. And here's number three. They supported each other in emotional support. <laughs> they supported each other in emotional support. I love that it says at the end of Acts chapter 2 verse 46, it says this, that, that they were together with gener glad and generous hearts. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. Man, they were just praising God. They're, happy. They're going for it. And I love that because I, I came across a study years ago um, of a, a study that PBS commissioned to, be, to better understand the relationship between relational connectiveness and happiness. And out of their research, it was so cool, they produced a documentary called This Emotional Life. And here's a quote from that that was so good from this documentary. It says this, researchers have found that people are happier when they are with other people than when they are alone. And the boost is the same for introverts as well as extroverts. They also are finding that Happy people are more pleasant, helpful, and sociable. Being around other people makes us feel happier. And when we are happier, there is more fun to be around. Creating, watch this, an upward spiral of happiness. I love that image, right? Upward spiral of happiness. And the reason why I love that image is because so often I've heard it said 
that depression is described as something like a downward spiral of discouragement. And so if these last two years have taught us anything, it's that we were made for each other. We were made for connection with one another. And researchers are actually finding that biologically and physiologically, it affects who we are. It affects our minds and changes our biochemical makeup when we are actually together with people. And and many of us sometimes get caught up in the day-to-day grind of our individual lives. And then we attend an event once a week and we're wondering, why don't we feel this relational connectedness and this upward spiral of happiness? And, And this brings me to my last point here is number four is missional living. This is what Circle, the early church did, is this idea of missional living. In Acts chapter uh, Chapter 2, verse 47, it says this, And the Lord added to their numbers, day by day, those who were being saved. He added to their numbers, day by day, those who were being saved. Circles actually help us, as we read here, help us live on mission together. It's not just simply for our benefit or our formation. They actually help us live on mission together. In fact, right now, I want to invite someone who I would consider one of the most evangelistic people I know. Whenever I think of Kako living and life groups doing things not just for themselves as a holy huddle, but really going out for others, it's this guy here. I think of Uncle Bono. In fact, a a, a while ago, Uncle Bono reminded me of a story that that I wanted him to share with us today to help us get a glimpse of living what living together missionally looks like. And so let's take a look at Uncle Bono sharing. Let's take a look. So where do I start? This is an awesome message. But, um, it's so important. You're talking about life group, right? Um, we, uh, so our old life group, well, my life group, Way back then, um, we did we did so much. I think Andy and Lindsay guys can witness to all of this. So uh, the importance of our life group. So we did a lot of things together. We we went, went to Disney World, Disneyland. We cried, we laughed, and R- Ryan too can witness to this too. So so that was so important because we we prayed for each other. So but but that's what life is all about. What Pastor Jerry was sharing. And so, and we do, we go camping. We love to camp. <laughs> yeah. We love to camp. And when we camp, you guys not inviting us. <laughs> well, when we camp, we have a large camp, like huge. But anyway, so at this one camp, I asked Pastor Tim, hey, I want to give the mess, uh, share a message at camp and like have church. He said, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so, but he didn't come, but his, uh, Tyler and his nephew came. Is uh, so, and what I'm sharing, this is not only about me, it was about my life group that came in agreement with what was, was I going to do. I, I mean, at night, the kids would, it was Saturday night, the kids would set up all the chairs, everything for church Sunday. So they set up everything, and my life group family, you know, just doing everything, and this was all for the Lord. So Sunday came, Sunday came, and then everything set up, right? So I led worship, and, and I gave a message. I forget about it. Talk about Jesus. <laughs> and, then, and then, so, um, yeah, um, Pastor Tim's nephew was there. And when I was leading worship, giving a message, and people from outside the campsite joining us, that was like, oh, yeah. That, that was awesome. So after the message, I mean, I had an altar call. Now I just went for it, you know. I had an altar call, and uh, Pastor Tim's nephew received Christ that day. And uh, my heart desire, church, right now, I can share right now. My heart desire is to bring as much people to heaven. So he received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and. Uh, and today, he's a worship leader somewhere in the mainland, and he's just he's on fire for God. And, um, but 
But with, there was an, an agreement with my life group. See, it wasn't only about me. I, I shared that with the life group that, hey, let's do this. And then we came in agreement, and boom, God delivered. As long as one is saved, praise the Lord. So I'm, I'm going to back this up with a scripture. And each and every one of you are chosen. Yeah. You guys are chosen, you know. That's right. And Jesus is speaking right here out of John 15, 16. He says this. You didn't choose me. This is Jesus now. You didn't choose me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed, I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. So much power in the name of Jesus, right? Yeah, wow. Verse 17 says, this is my command, love each other. But we are chosen. You guys, each and every one of you are chosen. It's going to happen, guys. You guys are going to have the opportunity to share the love of Christ. And to invite that person, whoever it may be, family, friends, to Christ. But I hope I encourage you with this testimony because you guys are chosen by the King of Kings. That's right. Yeah. By Jesus Christ. Yeah. And life group, the life group is so vital, so important. Because here, Saturdays, I love this. But we come on life group on Wednesday nights or whatever nights. That's the meat. That's where we grow, right, church? So I encourage you, church. Yeah, I encourage you. Find the time. Get into a life group. Host one. Yeah. Well, other than that, thank you, Pastor Jared. Wasn't that awesome? Can we thank Uncle Bono? Thank the Lord for Uncle Bono, everybody. Go ahead and ch type it in the chat box. We love you, Uncle Bono. Hey, we get to celebrate that together. And that happens, listen family, it happens in circles, not just in rows, right? Because being in rows helps a lot, but being in circles are better. You know, I love that we are in a building where, where we get to gather on Saturday evenings or we get to be online on Sundays. Um, and, and I praise God that the space that we've been given is just the, God's favor over our church. Man, Gr Grace Point Church has been such a blessing to us. That I could share stories all like just for hours of how God has just provided for us miraculously through this season of just waiting to see where we're going to meet on a Sunday, if we're going to meet back on a Sunday morning and how we're going to do that. He's been providing miraculously. But please hear my heart in this. Hear my heart that, that our weekend services are incredible, but they're the push, but not the point. They're the push, but not the point to why we do what we do. We are a battleship family. We are a, we're not a cruise ship. And, and, and as we gather together, we're actually getting to have opportunity to get equipped. When we gather together in our weekend service, we get equipped to live on mission together to, to our neighborhoods, in our communities, at our jobs, and to our families. We are placed in the places that we are on purpose, for a purpose, and we get to do that together in circles. Being on mission is far more than simply attending something once a week. In fact, did you ever notice the numbers that were added to the early church? How often does it say they were added? It says daily. It says daily. Now, how, how would they know? How would they know that numbers are being added daily if they weren't in some way, in some capacity, meeting daily? Let's think about it like this. If Jesus spent 12 hours a day with, for three years with his disciples, how many hours would that be? Now, this is, a, this is a math problem. I'm not very good at math, but, but it's a lot, right? Praise Jesus, a lot. No, I already did the math. It would be about 13,000 hours together. They would have spent 13,000 hours together in, um, in, the, in the days, the three years that they were together. And even after all of that time with Jesus himself, his closest friends, the disciples, still had some ga major gaps, didn't they? His disciples still had a lot of growing to do. And I share that to say that one hour, one time a week is not enough to truly appreciate and apprent be apprenticed by Jesus. Listen, it, it needs to be a whole life of just endeavor, just journeying with the Lord. In fact, throughout this month, you're going to have an opportunity
to both experience and join a life group. And I cannot encourage you enough to at least dip your toe in those waters and give it a shot. Now listen, I, I understand, I realize that, that maybe for some of you, you're like, man, that's terrifying to show up at a stranger's house or get to know people that you don't know at all. But can I tell you that circles are better than rows? Circles are better than rows. It's about what happens between the Sundays that, that matters the most. Here's one more thing, one more critical reason why what we do between Sundays matters so much. You see, Jesus himself said this in John 13, 35. He says this, By this, all people, the world, will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. If you have love for one another. There's a lot of love that I get to see and witness on a Saturday evening service or on a Sunday morning when we gather together online here. And there's a lot of love. But one thing that, that I hear most often when, when I have people come and, and they're coming for the first time, I hear them come and I ask them, why, why, did, you, why did you make your way to our church again? Why did you make this our church, your church home? I often hear people say things like, you can just feel the love. PG, PJ, you can just feel the love. You feel the welcome um, and you feel part of the family. There's a lot of aloha that happens during our weekend services. And I get that. I love, I love it too, man. I love what we get to experience on our weekend gatherings. But watch this, you family. To love one another the way that Jesus himself commands us can't just simply happen once, one day a week. In fact, in the New Testament, there are 59 one another's that are instructed to us as the church. 59 one another's of, of doing life in circles and what this looks like. And I want to just read them to you. Here's what, it, here's what they are. The New Testament tells us this. It tells us to serve one another, to accept one another, to, to strengthen one another, to help one another, to encourage one another, to care for one another, to forgive one another, to submit to one another, to commit to one another, to build and trust with one another, to be devoted to one another, to be patient with one another, to be interested in one another, to be accountable to one another, to confess to one another, to live in harmony with one another. Don't be conceited with one another. Don't pass judgment with one another. Don't slander one another. Instruct one another. Greet one another. Admonish one another. Spur one another on. Meet with one another. Agree, agree with one another. Be concerned with one another. Be humble with one another. Be the same mind with one another. Be compassionate with one another. Do not be consumed with one another. Do not be angry with one another. Do not lie to one another. Live at peace with one another. Do not grumble with one another. Give preference to one another. Be at peace with one another. Sing to one another. Comfort one another. Be kind to one another. Carry one another's burdens and love one another. Imagine trying to accomplish all of that in one hour, one time a week. Does that seem feasible? Family, it's not possible. We are better when we're together. When we're kako in Christ, we were made for each other. I love what Mother Teresa said. He, she said once, she said, if, if we have no peace, it's because we've forgotten that we belong to one another. There's a lot of brokenness in our world right now. And there's a lot of pain and I love what we do together and I love gathering on weekends like this and singing praises and learning from God's word in this space. But, but it's the push and not the point. This is the push to live on mission in a world that's so desperate in need of God's grace and his goodness in our lives. We do this together. And family, I'm absolutely convinced that when we're, that we're better together, that we're made for each other. Rows are great, but circles, circles are better. Here's a quote from a scholar named Eugene Peterson who authored the Message Bible. Some of you have that Bible and I love it. It says this, There can be no maturity in our spiritual life, no obedience in following Jesus, no wholeness in Christian living apart from the immersion and embrace of community. I am not myself 
by myself. I love that. I am not myself by myself. And so let me just be crystal clear here. I am desperately wanting all of us to be a part of a life group. And, and I'm not just saying like a life group at our church or what, just being in community with a group of people or a, or a person or two people just to do life together and to experience the beauty and messy aspects of being a part of this community. This church is actually started because of a small group. And it was because of this small group of young men and young women who were hungry for Jesus and desperate for deep connection and relationship with one another that led to the start of a little church called Hope Chapel Mililani. Now, in, in 34 years later, out of this, this beautiful small group, we get to see these sprouting small groups coming out, these life groups happening right in our time, right now, all over Mililani and over Pearl City. Um, I, I've heard um, Andy is starting a small a life group and Pastor Terrence is starting a small group and, and Bono has a life group going on and Evile for years have been doing a life group. Karen, even Pono, or one of our high school students are saying, man, I'm going to do a life group and Michael with young adults and Shomi with a few group of women and, and Dennis and Beverly on Zoom and, and watch this, Kristen and Angelina as they just walk together in Mauka and talk. That, this is life group. It's a small group of people choosing friendship with God and each other. And so as I wrap up, let me just go back to our very first opening question, okay? Let me go back to that question. Are you an observant person? When you looked around at the people who are with you watching this, this um, today in the room, what did you notice? Maybe you noticed a new haircut. Maybe you noticed a new outfit. But maybe, maybe you didn't notice anything at all. And as great as rows are, can I just remind you today that circles... Circles are better. That we need people, we all need people to walk this life with. We need people by our sides, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so let, let me just ask you this. What if, what if we didn't just simply invite people to church? What if we invited them into our very lives? I wholeheartedly believe that that, that could change the world. I wholeheartedly be, believe that it would change everything in Jesus' name. Can you say amen to that family? Let's pray together. Would you bow your heads? Let's pray. Loving Father, thank you so much for the, your goodness. Thank you, Lord, that you get to show us through the example of the early church what it looked like for, for them to have spiritual depth, for them to have physical needs met, for them to be emotionally supportive and live missionally. Lord, thank you, Lord God, that we get to gather, but this gathering online or even in person on Saturday is just the push and not the point. Lord, uh, the point is so that we can live together in deep one anotherness with you and with each other. And so, Lord, we thank you for today. Help us in our minds to be open to what you're going to do throughout this week and throughout this month and throughout this series. We love you, Lord. We thank you, honor you with our lives today. In Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week, everybody. Cheers.